You ain't doing it right unless you're doing it twice. Oh man, I only had you out here for a minute. Yikes. Hope you start. Welcome back to another episode of Bleep and Jeep, where today we are going to do hydraulic assist steering. So I'm going to install this. This is a Bleep and Jeep steering box that I've already sent in and had ported. So you can do this on your own box. Most people will try to do that with a drill bit and grease on it and hope that they drill in the right spot, not too far, and also hope that they don't get any metal shavings inside the box, which then is gonna ruin your entire system. So I didn't have to pull my steering box. I actually pulled this box from Pull Apart and then just sent it in. And then they completely rebuilt it. So any seals that are bad and poured it for hydraulic assist. So it's hard to see, but this bolt right here is what holds the steering shaft on the steering box. We have to pull that out, then we can just pop that steering shaft back. It'll slide back out of the way, and then we can work on pulling our pitman arm and unbolting our box. All right, so we got the bolt out. Now you should be able to just push this back just a little bit. So the plastic on my steering shaft is just too stiff. I can't get it to pop loose all the way, but I got it to back off a little bit. So now I'm going to go ahead and pull my pitman arm here. And you just need an inch and five sixteenths, if I remember right. And to remove your pitman arm, I know I've shown this before, but this is a Snap-on CJ-11-9B. And they make different ones. I mean, you can get, you can get your own. You don't have to buy a Snap-on one, but I have had this one for about 20 years. And... It just helps pull the pitman arm off. You basically set it on there, zip this up, and it pulls it off without having to damage your sector shaft, without damaging your steering box. And what that's going to do for me is that gives me another good Jeep steering box in the future. If I need to, if I want to do another hydraulic assist on another Jeep, I can just send that box in and, and have it done. So, whoa, that's quick. To save the life of one of these, they got really fine threads. Just make sure you hit them with a bunch of anti-seize. And that's really all you need to do. In the last, I mean, like I said, this one's lasted me 20 years. Unbolt the lines, which that's always the worst part, right? Is getting the, pulling the hydraulic lines and just getting all gooey. So one of the things I did before taking the box off is I went ahead and loosened the lines up because they're really, really tight, and they probably never came off before, and then I sprayed a little WD-40 on the top. Then I went ahead and took the box off, and that way I should be able to just spin these free now fairly easy. Easy money, and it's gonna make a mess, so I got you right there. Also, one really important thing to remember is you don't wanna crisscross these lines. You want them to go in the exact way that they're going in, and that's the great thing about cell phones. Uh, you know, I can, this one's obviously pretty rusty. This one's not, so I can just take a picture of them and know exactly which way they go back in. Uh, just kidding. In most cases, and same with this one, the opening for the actual steering shaft only can go on one way. It actually has a flat spot in it, so you can't put it on crooked or mess up the splines. Now, some older vehicles that is a possibility that can happen. So uh, that's just one thing you wanna pay attention to is make sure that your steering wheel's straight and that you can turn your box and that it's straight when you put it back on. Keys and anything with a unibody, I would definitely lock tight your steering box bolts. Yeah, you just don't want these to come loose. Cherry juice, cherry juice. You always smell like delicious cherry juice, but I'm afraid to eat you. Mmm, smells so good, as I don't want to get blocked up on the other end. <laughs> now there's probably a certain torque spec for the steering box, but because I already have mine plated with that JCR plate, inner and outer and sleeved, I'm really not that worried about it. I just want it tight. German tight. Good and tight. So the nut of the sector shaft, I went ahead and made sure that I put Loctite on the threads. Not so much on the splines, but just on the threads. The torque spec for this is 187 foot-pounds. My torque wrenches only go to 150 foot-pounds. I, I need to get a bigger one. But until then, I'm just going to impact this bad boy on. Okay. 
And so now that that's all hooked up, then the next thing you want to do is go to your RAM. Now, sometimes I say people do like to go to the aggro RAM. The reason that I'm not a huge fan of those is because you have to get big blocky tabs that you have to weld on to everything to make them actually fit because they're like a big C when they bolt on. I would rather have a regular RAM, and that's why I chose to go with the Trail Gear RAM. Now, I know immediately you're like, wait a minute, these guys are known for Toyota parts, which is true. They are known for Toyota parts. They're also known for Suzuki parts. But this is a universal kit, and that's why I chose to do the Trail Gear RAM. I've used this before multiple times on my Hydro Assist, and this is a really simple plug-and-play kit. Not only does it come with the RAM, which you can get an inch and a half or two inch, but it also comes with your brackets that you weld on to bolt on, to bolt your RAM on, along with all your ends and bolts and everything you need, along with your hoses. And so to have a whole kit like that, that all you gotta do is just bolt it, in, bolt it in and be done, it's really hard to beat. So there's a few different sizes of RAMs, and there's a few different lengths of RAMs. If you're unsure which one you need, I would go ahead and take your steering and turn it all the way to the passenger side. Then I'd make a mark on your tie rod that you can reference to your axle, then turn completely the other way and take that measurement and you'll know the difference. So I have this thing all the way past here because I'm gonna mount the body against the axle. And what I wanna do is have this collapsed all the way as well, so that way I can see exactly where it needs to mount. I'm thinking about doing something just like this. Obviously, you don't want your ram sitting down into the danger zone of all the rocks, so I'll have to do a tube and build some sort of bracket to protect it. So I measured mine really, really close, and I have just a little over seven inches of steering. Now I have an eight inch ram, but that's okay. You can take the ram apart. You can actually take this off, and you can machine a spacer to go in there that will make this a seven inch ram. The problem with that is it's just a lot of work and machining, and I just don't have that kind of time. The other thing you can do is just bolt it up. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give myself a half inch of space here. And what that's going to mean is later on, maybe I can find a pitman arm that actually extends out. And as long as nothing binds, I can have that full eight inches of steering. And then that way, all I got to do is just put it on and this ram will already be set up for it. The one thing I do want to be careful of, though, is when I'm steering sharp, when I'm full lock, I need to back back off. Now you should do this anyway, because what that's gonna do is that's gonna wear your pump out. If you're full lock and you're holding it full lock where the pump's whining and fighting you, that is where this ram is gonna try to pull in even more, and then you could actually break stuff. So um, that's one thing you really wanna be cautious of, just don't do that. <laughs> or you can put a spacer in, or have somebody put a spacer in. In this case, I'm just gonna drive it smarter, and that way I don't have that problem. And then later on, hopefully, maybe I can find that pitman arm, and then I'll have a full eight inches of stroke on this ram. So I just got to get in here and, and clean this up with a die grinder, and then I can put that up against there. The trail gear setup is it's made for a Toyota axle, so this would actually have been on the housing side, and then the other piece would be on your steering side, but I wanted to use that on the actual housing. Sometimes I've been able to make that work, in this case not, so I just had these old barn shackles, I drilled them out to three quarter. Well, I messed up a little bit. This hole, I thought it was three quarter, I just eyeballed it, it's actually too big. So I thought that this was a three quarter uh, drill bit. This is a three quarter drill bit. This is a 13 16 I thought I had a three quarter in here. I don't know what I drilled out that was 13 16 the last time I was using it, but whatever it was, that's what it was. I guessed the right bolt size. I just didn't have the right bit. <laughs> no point in doing a project unless you're gonna do things twice, right? And just like that, the Jeep got rammed. <laughs> but now, I still gotta hook my lines up, which what I'm probably gonna do is route them up and in through here on my track bar, because the track bar flexes nice and smooth without going side to side, and then up to the box. And then I gotta build something here to protect this ram, because you don't want your ram, you know, it's unfortunate, I just don't have enough room here to where I safely felt 
mounting it there would work. So Trail Gear makes this about as easy as it can be. You have one side that has 90s and then the other side is straight up and down. It's just a straight connection. But they do come with 90 degree connections that you can put on. So I can run those here. I'm probably going to run these here and put these up at the box because I want to come down to that track bar and over. One of the other things they come with too are these two pieces and this is if you were to tap the box yourself. So if you were to tap your own box it comes with an MPT thread to a dash six that you can do that with if you want to. Also one other great thing too is keep these caps if for some reason if for some reason you were ever to have a hose failure you can cap off your box and then you can still keep driving it just undo your ram cap off your box and then you still have regular steering just not hydraulically assisted all you do is just tie the hoses in let's go back here to my powder coat oven and i found this this is a leftover piece of 250 wall that i had that's a perfect length and I just need a couple kickers to come out. So I just need to find a couple inch and a half pieces in here that are at least seven inches long. If you guys remember a couple videos back, we were watching my daughter's dog. That. That's a little puppy poo poo. So I'm gonna clean that up too while I'm back in this corner. <laughs> all right so i found my tubing down here that's going to protect my ram i have a 250 wall which is basically a quarter inch thick going across the front and then i have 120 wall which is an eighth inch thick dom for each side just to kind of keep it supported now i gotta notch this out going into this side and no no better no better way to do it to really do it with than with the plasma <laughs> yeah yeah there's no better way to do it than with a plasma cutter. And I actually got this uh, Plasma Titanium 65 edition, I think is what it's called. And it's from Harbor Freight. And so I'm going to actually give it, put it to the test. Dang, that was nice. Why is it taking me so long to get one of these? All right, let's just set it up here and then I probably got to mark some new notches. But yeah, we're getting there. Getting closer. Okay, so I got everything notched out where I need it for it to slide in there and be about perfect. Now I just need to make my actual notch for my tubing. I just marked my high point and then now I just got to drill it out. If you guys don't have one of these, I would suggest getting one if you're ever gonna do tube work. This affordable bender setup I did on this Harbor Freight, um, on this Harbor Freight bench has worked really, really well for me. I built the cage, the upper half of the cage on the Samurai with this. I built a few other cages with it. It works really, really well. I built my front bumper with this. If you're a hobbyist, this is a really good setup to have. <laughs> Knew that was gonna happen. So my brother was giving me grief that my old angle finder wasn't good enough. So he got me this for Christmas. I'm pretty excited about it. This is gonna be the hardest part. Center line with one hand while the other hand holds a piece of quarter inch tubing over his head. <laughs> there you go. We have a bash bar, ladies and gentlemen. Whoop, whoop. Bash it up. Okay, one more. Went ahead and added a gusset there so it won't bang up. I could probably still do a plate here later on if I want to, but I think this is more than enough to protect that ram.
slash me. Not me. So if you guys remember back at the beginning of this build, I stole a bunch of parts off my command sheet. From the axles to the steering and everything else. So I have this PSC pump and this PSC reservoir, which I'm going to put on my rig. But I do want to show you how to do this if you're doing it with your own pump. Okay, so while we're going to let the bash bar dry from painting, I'm going to go ahead and start on the pump. Now there's a lot of, a lot of little things you can do to a pump to make it better. Obviously, you can buy a better pump. Or if you don't want to mess with your pump, then I would suggest instead of doing a two inch ram, do an inch and a half ram, which is a lot smaller and takes less volume. In this case, I am going to go ahead and push this pressure up just a little bit and push the volume up just a little bit. So I took the reservoir off just for ease for you to be able to see it. You don't not you do not have to take the reservoir off. All you got to do is take your line off. And then this piece here, which is a seven eighths, this is the piece that holds that spring in. So I got to be really careful when I pull it out here. You see how it just tried to push me out. Okay, if you look right in there, you can see that opening, and that's what we have to open up just the tiniest bit. Here's the pressure pieces that I was talking about. So, so the way this works is this sits in there, and this is part of that pressurized pump. What I'm going to do is add a little washer, and what that's going to do is add more pressure to this pump. Do, 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 do. Sleeves, washers, kick on the light so I can see what I'm doing. All right, what I want to do here is just find a washer that fits that side. So just, just for reference here, this is a quarter inch, I believe this is a quarter inch washer here for a quarter inch bolt. And it's just a little bit too big. Now I can grind this down, but I have a whole pile of washers here. I think I'm gonna to try to find the right one. So right here, I have a 764 drill bit. And that just fits in and out of there. So the next size I have up here is an eighth inch. And that's ju it just won't fit. So this is the one I'm going to drill this out with. I'm just going to drill it out with an eighth inch. And then we can put it all back together. And then we have our makeshift high pressure pump. I do want to go ahead and hit that with brake clean. It's got a little bit of metal in there. So you just got to spray it out, clean it up, make sure you don't have any chunks left inside. So this is what it looks like inside of there. All I'm going to do is take this washer and put it down first. Now there's a port about so deep that this spring sits in. So the washer will go first, then the spring, then we put the piston back in, and then we put our drilled out piece on top. And that's exactly what that's going to do is create just a little more pressure. It's going to put a little more pressure in the pump, and then we're going to have a little bit bigger orifice for it to come out. So it's just going to get a little more fluid. That simple. Finally, my power steering parts showed up only about six days later than they were supposed to. I probably should have ordered them from Amazon and not AutoZone, but uh, either way, they're here now, so let's put them in. Oh, there's got to be a better way to tighten these up than like this. Yeah. Yeah. Here's the steering box I pulled out. Just so you know, this is the pressure side. So from your pump itself, that goes down into this side of the box, and that's your pressure side. That puts pressure into the box, allows it to turn. This is your return side. This is basically a lot less pressure, and it comes up back to your reservoir. But what I did, because I, if you guys remember way back when I, when I fixed the front end and put the radiator in, and my fan kicks on, <laughs> Hold on. Anyways, so if you remember way back when I fixed the front end, I put a radiator in that was for an automatic transmission. Now I have a manual. So an automatic transmission radiator comes with a tranny cooler built into the radiator. So from my return line, instead of going back to the reservoir, I went up to the tranny cooler line. And then from the top of the tranny cooler line on the radiator, I went to the reservoir. And what that's going to do is keep this power steering a lot cooler than it would be without that. And because I've already done that and I need a radiator anyway, it was a lot cheaper than buying a radiator and then still having to buy a power steering cooler as well. Okay, so instead of putting my return line back up to my box, I put my return line back to the radiator and then my radiator line is gonna go to the box where the tranny cooler would be. 
Okay, so I got everything hooked back up. All I'm doing here now is just spinning the pump a little bit and filling in, filling up the reservoir and just letting it work its way through the system and try to get as many air bubbles out. There's really two ways to really fail your power steering system. And that is number one, holding it at full cock, like when you turn it all the way and you just hold it there, that'll burn up your pump. And the second way, which is way more common too, is probably letting air into the system when you're trying to set it up. The first thing I'm gonna do here is just lightly spin the pump and get as much air out of here and just let it slowly drain and I'll fill it back up and slowly drain. And that way I can at least get as much fluid in there as possible. And then we'll move to the next step. The next step with the rig up on jack stands, you do not want to try to do this on the ground. You want as little pressure on it as possible is to turn the wheel back and forth as many times as you can and try to get all that air out of that ram up through the pump without pumping it. Anything you can do before you start pumping is the best way to get the air out first. All right, so I worked it back and forth at least 20, 30 times, kept filling the top off, just try to get as much out of it as I can. Now I'm gonna go ahead and just bump start it. I'm just gonna try to get the pump to run just a little bit and try to work that fluid real quick. And then I'm gonna check it again before I do anything. And I'll just continue to do that until I know this is gonna stay full. And then I'll go back with it running and do the same thing back and forth, working it and making sure that I don't let that pump go, let that pump go dry. So it's really ideal to have a second person here that can watch that pump while the other person's steering. Fortunately today, I'm by myself as a lot of times and probably like many of you at home. So that's how I'm gonna do it. So it's probably hard to see here, especially cause the hole's so small, but I had this thing full to the top, knowing it's gonna suck some down in. And just with that quick little bump start, it's already halfway down in the reservoir. So before letting it go dry, I'm gonna fill it all the way back up to the top again, and then I'll do it a couple more times. And that's basically the process until it stops doing it, and then we'll do the steering wheel back and forth. I sprung a little leak. Bubble, 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 bubble. All right, so it's the next day, and I was going to go for a drive, show you guys how all this works before I go ahead and put my PSC stuff back on up top, because I figured you guys didn't see how to do that anyway, because you just want to see how the regular pump goes on. So you can see that it's snowing, and the next project I'm doing now is the body work. And anybody that knows body work knows that you don't want to have a muddy, messy truck to start your body work with. That's unfortunate. Another unfortunate thing is I'm still waiting on my hood to show up. I ordered a new hood because my hood is just too messed up. So we're gonna go ahead and move forward into Josh's WJ build and then we'll jump back on this when we have a chance. I just wanna remind you guys that we're gonna be in Ohio February 25th and 26th, the Dayton Off-Road and Outdoor Expo. While Colt's over there dealing with the snow, we're over here in beautiful East Tennessee weather and we're gonna be seeing you guys at the Dayton Off-Road Expo in Ohio, like he said, but we need your opinion on which vehicle to take. Which one should I bring? Should I bring the, which on that side? <laughs> should I bring the Scorpion Crawler or should I bring the Comanche? Now, a lot of people said the Comanche, but if you guys wanna see the Scorpion Crawler, I need your vote. So let me know down in the comments below. So I hope to see you guys out there at the Dayton Off-Road and Outdoor Expo. Make sure you come by, say hi, we'll hang out. Got some stickers, got shirts, we'll bring all kinds of good stuff. And don't think when I finish up Rat's Nest that we're done building. We have this really cool Onyx project coming on, and that's going to be the very next thing that we're going to be working on in this vehicle right here, possibly. And if you know what this vehicle is, let me know. Make sure you like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.